Square Off will always hold a special place in my heart. It was THE Ash of War, always found on my power stance straight swords when I first began invading in Elden Ring to learn PvP mechanics. And I was great at invading. Really good. So good that I... Huh. As you can probably guess, it only took a few invasions with other weapons to realize I wasn't actually as good at the game as I thought I was. And so I put Square Off away along with my Flaming Strike Knight Rider's Glaive, and moved on. It wasn't until much, much later, after I've gotten way better at PvP, that I decided to return to Square Off, this time without relying on the crutch of power stancing. I was going to learn how to two-hand a straight sword, and I'm really glad I did. It was a lot of fun. In this guide, I'm going to show you how to two-hand straight swords from the perspective of a regular Elden Ring player. No fancy hot swaps or wave dashing or reverse back steps. Not that I have anything against the fancy community or against power stancing. I love watching Elden Ring being played at a competitive level. But I wanted to make a video for people like me. People looking for fun, competent builds outside of the meta. The regular folk the average PvP enthusiast. The two-handed straight sword has a major problem. It lacks a reliable approach. The jumping R1 lacks range, while the R2 lacks range, horizontal reach, and is easily punished due to its surprisingly long recovery time. The running R1 is also very slow and predictable, and so we're stuck with the next best thing. The running R2 comes out slow enough that if the opponent panic rolls too early, they will get roll caught. This won't hit anybody who's expecting it, but in the heat of battle, even against experienced opponents, it works a lot better than you might expect. Ah, the crouch poke. Only available on some straight swords, this is the only unreactable move in your toolkit. For that reason, Although the broadsword is technically the strongest straight sword, I wouldn't recommend it, as you lose a very valuable move in your toolkit. Not only does the thrust come out extremely fast, but the recovery is nearly instant as well. This allows you to pressure opponents while dodging in close quarters, as well as allowing you to punish certain attacks in between animations, such as the Colossal R1 chain. From experience, the poke also comes out so fast that it very consistently bypasses your opponent's natural timing for parrying rolling attacks, even on my hardwired connection with consistent sub-50 ping. The speed of this move and its recovery is vital, since most opponents will have the poise to trade against you. Its range is also pretty short for a thrusting attack. If your opponent is expecting the crouch poke as you roll directly next to them, you can instead hold a standing R2, which has enough range to roll catch them as they dodge away, although the timing on that is extremely tight. Square Off is one of the few Ashes of War that have two genuinely unique skills in one. They are slow, predictable, and have no hyper armor, so most of the time, you will want to use them after a hit stun or some other distracting event. That being said, the R1 is deceptively fast and has enough forward momentum to roll catch your opponent if they are fairly close. This works especially well after connecting a running R2 as the opponent is very likely to panic roll out. The R1 does enough poise damage to break certain moves with hyper armor, such as the colossal crouch poke, as well as everything in the Chilling Mist and Sacred Blade family. It will also break most shields it connects with in a single hit. Square Off's R2 is even slower than the R1, with all the disadvantages. Therefore, most of the time you will be relying on your R1. That being said, the R2 has a generous hitbox, covers a surprising distance, and can keep pace with two medium rolls. It also has pretty good tracking within 180 degrees. Overall, 
It performs very similarly to Giant Hunt, and if used sparingly, can catch even the most experienced opponents off guard. Note that this move does have a somewhat long recovery, and will leave you vulnerable to faster counters such as Raptor's Mist and Quick Step. Although these four moves are your bread and butter, they are not the only moves you should use. Throw in neutral lights and jump mix-ups to keep your opponent on their toes. The most important thing with any build in Elden Ring is not simply throwing out unpredictable attacks to see if they stick, but narrowing down the list of movements your opponent will do in response to every action. For example, when you perform a running R2, your opponent can roll, jump, or the move will connect. So, at that moment, you should already be planning your follow-up tailored to a very narrow range of possibilities. With all that said, these four moves are the ones most likely to land, which makes this actually a fairly high damaging build. To win a duel, you will generally need to land four to five of some combination of these major pieces. The build that you're seeing is just a generic strength build. If I didn't run out of larval tears, I probably would swap the Urgery's favor for a Shard of Alexander. Since as an addendum to what was mentioned before, you probably will actually need to land more than four or five of the major pieces listed above when accounting for Ritual Shield and Blue Feather Branch Talismans. That extra Ash of Ward damage will help, and increases your chance of bypassing your opponent reaching 20% health entirely. What I would not change though is the 101 Poise. Storm Stomp and Flaming Strike are deadly to a low priority close range build. Low priority simply means that, due to a lack of range and hyper armor, you have a high chance of being stunned out of your poise breaking attacks before they connect with your opponent, especially because those attacks tend to be slower. For those reasons, I found this build to be weaker to longer, faster weapons that have high poise damage, namely greatswords, curved greatswords, halberds, and reapers, primarily because it's always a risk to predict if your opponent will swing the weapon a second or a third time. Overall, the two-handed straight sword won't break the meta. However, it is an extremely fun build with a learning curve and high skill cap that makes you work hard for every single satisfying hit. Its moveset is diverse and unconventional enough that it can at least keep up with even high level players and the best setups. If you found this video interesting, I hope you'll check out the rest of the series in my channel where I showcase this build against a diverse array of players and builds. Until next time, I'll see you in the arena.